Only kids are afraid of the dark. Through the silent shifting shadows, grotesque forms go drifting by. Phantom shapes prowl o'er the darkness, great winged hellions stalk the sky. In the ghostly, ghastly grayness, soulless horrors make their home. Know they well this land of evil. Corlos is the world they roam. Found in a central European cavern, once the temple of a dark sect. Author unknown. Darkness. Everywhere there was darkness. Grim, foreboding, omnipresent. It hung over the plain like a great stifling mantle. No moonlight sifted down. No stars shone from above. Only night, sinister and eternal, and the swirling, choking gray mists that shifted and stirred with every movement. Something screeched in the distance, but its form could not be seen. The mists and the shadows cloaked all. But no, one object was visible. In the middle of the plain, Rising to challenge the grim black mountains in the distance, a smooth, needle-like tower thrust up into the dead sky. Miles it rose, up to where the crackling crimson lightnings played eternally on the polished black rock. A dull scarlet light gleamed from the lone tower window, one single isle in a sea of night. In the swirling mists below, things stirred uneasily, and the rustles of strange movements and scramblings broke the deathly silence. The unholy denizens of Corlos were uneasy, for when the light shone in the tower, it meant that its owner was at home, and even demons can know fear. High in the summit of the black tower, a grim entity looked out of the single window at the yawning darkness of the plains and cursed them solemnly. Raging, the being turned from the swirling mist of the eternal night toward the well-lighted interior of its citadel. A whimper broke the silence. Chained helplessly to the marble wall, a hideous shape twisted in vain against its bonds, the entity was displeased. Raising one hand, it unleashed a bolt of black power toward the straining horror on the wall. A shriek of agony cut the endless night, and the bonds went limp. The chained demon was gone. No sound disturbed the solitude of the tower or its grim occupant. The entity rested on a great bat-like throne carved from some glowing black rock. It stared across the room and out the window, at the half-seen somethings churning through the dark clouds. At last the being cried aloud, and its shout echoed and re-echoed down the miles and miles of the sinister tower. Even in the black pit of the dungeons far below it was heard, and the demons imprisoned there shuddered in expectation of even greater agony, for the cry was the epitome of rage. A bolt of black power shot from an upraised fist into the night. Something screamed outside, and an unseen shape fell writhing from the skies. The entity snarled. Feeble sport. There is better to be had in the realm of mortals, where once I reigned, and where I would roam once more to hunt again for human souls. 
When will the commandment be fulfilled, and the sacrifice be made that will release me from this eternal exile? Thunder rumbled through the darkness. Crimson lightnings played among the black mountains, and the denizens of Corlos cringed in fear. Sagale, prince of demons, lord of Corlos, king of the netherworld, was angry and restless once more. And when the lord of darkness was displeased, his subjects were sent scrambling in terror through the mists. For long ages, the great temple had lain hidden by sand and jungle, alone and deserted. The dust of centuries had gathered on its floor, and the silence of eons brooded in the grim, dark recesses. Dark and evil it was, so generations of natives declared it taboo, and it stood alone through the ages. But now, after timeless solitude, the great black doors carved with their hideous and forgotten symbols creaked open once more. Footsteps stirred the dust of three thousand years, and echoes disturbed the silence of the dark places. Slowly, nervously, with cautious glances into the darkness, two men sneaked into the ancient temple. They were dirty men, unwashed and unshaven, and their faces were masks of greed and brutality. Their clothes were in rags, and they each carried long, keen knives next to their empty, useless revolvers. They were hunted men, coming to the temple with blood on their hands and fear in their hearts. The larger of the two, the tall, lean one called Jasper, surveyed the dark, empty temple with a cold and cynical eye. It was a grim place even by his standards. Darkness prevailed everywhere, in spite of the burning jungle sun outside, for the few windows there were had been stained a deep purple hue through which little light could pass. The rest was stone a grim ebony stone carved centuries ago. There were strange, hideous murals on the walls, and the air was dank and stale with the smell of death. Of the furnishings, all had long decayed into dust, save the huge black altar at the far end of the room. Once there had been stairs leading to a higher level, but they were gone now rotted into nothingness. Jasper unslung his knapsack from his back and turned to his short, fat companion. Guess this is it, Willie, he said, his voice a low, guttural rumble. Here's where we spend the night. Willie's eyes moved nervously in their sockets, and his tongue flicked over dry lips. I don't like it, he said. This place gives me the creeps. It's too dark and spooky. And look at them things on the walls. He pointed toward one of the more bizarre of the murals. Jasper laughed, a snarling, bitter, cruel laugh from deep in his throat. We got to stay someplace, and the natives will kill us if they find us out in the open. They know we've got those sacred rubies of theirs. Come on, Willie. There's nothing wrong with this joint, and the natives are scared to come near it. So it's a little dark. Big deal. Only kids are afraid of the dark. Yeah, I... I guess you're right. 
Willie said hesitantly. Removing his knapsack, he squatted down in the dust next to Jasper and began removing the makings of a meal. Jasper went back out into the jungle and returned minutes later, his arms laden with wood. A small fire was started, and the two squatted in silence and hastily consumed their small meal. Afterward they sat around the fire and spoke in whispers of what they would do in civilization with the sudden wealth they had come upon. Time passed, slowly but inexorably. Outside, the sun sank behind the mountains in the west. Night came to the jungle. The temple's interior was even more foreboding by night. The creeping darkness that spread from the walls put a damper on conversation. Yawning, Jasper spread his sleeping bag out on the dust-covered floor and stretched out. He looked up at Willie. I'm gonna call it a day, he said. How about you? Willie nodded. Yeah, he said. Guess so. He hesitated. But not on the floor. All that dust? Could be bugs. Spiders, maybe. Night crawlers. I ain't gonna be bit all night in my sleep. Jasper frowned. Where, then? There ain't no furniture left in the place. Willie's hard, dark eyes traveled around the room, searching. There, he exclaimed. That thing looks wide enough to hold me, and the bugs won't be able to get at me up there. Jasper shrugged. Suit yourself, he said. He turned over and soon was asleep. Willie waddled over to the great carven rock, spread his sleeping bag open on it, and clambered up noisily. He stretched out and closed his eyes, shuddering as he beheld the carving on the ceiling. Within minutes his stout frame was heaving regularly, and he was snoring. Across the length of the dark room, Jasper stirred, sat up, and peered through the gloom at his sleeping companion. Thoughts were running feverishly through his head. The natives were hot on their trail, and one man could move much faster than two, especially if the second was a fat, slow cow like Willie. And then there were the rubies, gleaming wealth greater than any he had ever dreamed of. They could be his. All his. Silently, Jasper rose and crept wolf-like through the blackness toward Willie. His hand went to his waist and extracted a slim, gleaming knife. Reaching the dais, he stood a moment and looked down on his comrade. Willie heaved and tossed in his sleep. The thought of those gleaming red rubies in Willie's knapsack ran again through Jasper's brain. The blade flashed up, then down. The fat one groaned once, briefly, and blood was spilled on the ancient sacrificial altar. Outside, lightning flashed from a clear sky, and thunder rumbled ominously over the hills. The darkness inside the temple seemed to deepen, and a low, howling noise filled the room. Probably the wind whistling through the ancient steeple, thought Jasper, as he fumbled for the jewels in Willie's knapsack. But it was strange how the wind seemed to be whispering a word. Lowly and beckoningly. Sagail, it seemed to call softly. Sagail. The noise grew from a whisper to a shout 
to a roar until it filled the ancient temple. Jasper looked around in annoyance. He could not understand what was going on. Above the altar, a large crack appeared, and beyond it mist swirled and things moved. Darkness flowed from the crack, darkness blacker and denser and colder than anything Jasper had ever witnessed. Swirling, shifting, it gathered itself into a pocket of absolute black in one corner of the room. It seemed to grow, to change shape to harden, and to coalesce. And quickly it was gone. In its place stood something vaguely humanoid, a large, powerful frame clad in garments of a soft, dark gray. It wore a belt and a cape, leathery things made from the hide of some unholy creature never before seen on earth. A hood of the cape covered its head, and underneath it only blackness stared out, marked by two pits of final night, darker and deeper than the rest, a great bat-like clasp of some dark glowing rock fastened the cape in place. Jasper's voice was a whisper. <gasps> Who are you? A low, hollow, haunting laughter filled the recesses of the temple and spread out through the night. I, I am war and plague and blood. I am death and darkness and fear. The laughter again. I am Sagail, prince of demons, lord of darkness, king of Korlos, unquestioned sovereign of the netherworld. I am Sagail, he whom your ancestors called the soul destroyer. And you have called me. Jasper's eyes were wide with fear, and the rubies, forgotten, lay in the dust. The apparition had raised a hand, and blackness and night gathered around it. Evil power coursed through the air. Then, for Jasper... There was only darkness, final and eternal. Halfway around the world, a spectral figure in gold and green stiffened suddenly in mid-flight, its body growing tense and alert. Across the death-white features spread a look of intense concern as the fathomless phantom mind once again became in tune with the very essence of its being. Dr. Weird recognized the strange sensations. They were telling him of the presence of a supernatural evil somewhere on the earth. All he had to do was to follow the eerie emanations, drawing him like a magnet to the source of the abominable activities, with the speed of thought, the spectral figure flashed away toward the east, led swiftly and unwaveringly to the source of evil. Mountains, valleys, rivers, woodlands zipped under him with eye-blurring speed. Great seacoast cities appeared on the horizon, their skyscrapers leaning on the heavens. Then they too vanished behind him, and angry rolling waves moved below. In a wink, a continent had been spanned. In another, an ocean was crossed. Earthly limits of speed and matter are of no consequence to a spirit. And suddenly, it was night. Thick, clutching jungles appeared below the golden ghost, 
their foliage all the more sinister by night. There was a patch of desert, a great roaring river, more desert. Then the jungle again. Human settlements popped up and vanished in the blink of an eye. The night parted in front of the streaking figure. Dr. Weird stopped. Huge and ominous, the ancient temple appeared suddenly in front of him, its great walls hiding grim and evil secrets. He approached cautiously. There was an aura of intense evil here, and the darkness clung to the temple thicker and denser than to the jungle around it. Slowly and warily, the astral avenger approached a huge black wall. His substance seemed to waver and fade as he passed effortlessly through it into the blackened inside. Dr. Weird shuddered as he beheld the interior of that dread sanctum. It was horribly familiar to him now. The dark, hideous murals, the row on row of felted ebony benches, and the huge statue that stared down from above the altar marked this unclean place as a temple of a long-forgotten sect. Those who had worshipped one of the black deities that lurk beyond. The earth had been cleaner when the last such had died out. And yet, Dr. Weird paused and pondered. Everywhere, everything looked new and unused, and, a sense of horror gripped him, there was fresh blood on the sacrificial altar. Could it be that the cult had been revived? That the dwellers in the shadows were worshipped again? There was a slight noise from a recess near the altar. Instantly, Dr. Weird whirled and searched for its source. Something barely moved in the darkness, and in a flash the golden ghost was upon it. It was a man, or what remained of one. Tall, lean, and muscular, it lay unmoving on the floor and stared from unseeing eyes. A heart beat and lungs inhaled, but there was no other motion. No will stirred this creature, no instincts prompted it. It lay still and silent, eyes focused vacantly on the ceiling, a discarded, empty shell. It was a thing without a mind, or a soul. Anger and horror raged through the breast of the astral avenger as he whirled searching the shadows for the thing of evil whose presence now overwhelmed him. Never had he encountered such an engulfing aura of raw, stark wickedness. All right, he shouted. I know you are here somewhere. I sense your evil presence. Show yourself, if you dare. A hollow, haunting laughter issued from the great dark walls and echoed through the hall. And who might you be? But Dr. Weird did not move. His spectral eyes swept the length and breadth of the temple, searching for the source of the eerie laughter. And again it came, deep, booming, and full of malevolence. But what does it matter, rash mortal? You presume to challenge forces you cannot begin to comprehend. Yet I shall fulfill your request. I shall reveal myself. The laughter grew louder. 
You shall soon rue your foolhardy words. From above, where polished ebony steps wound upward into the highest reaches of the Black Temple's tower and steeple, a viscous, fluid, living darkness seemed to ooze down the winding staircase. Like a great cloud of absolute black from the nightmare of a madman, it descended until halfway down it solidified and took shape. The thing that stood on the stairs was vaguely manlike, but the resemblance only made it even more horrible. Its laughter filled the temple again. Doth my visage please you, mortal? Why do you not answer? Can it be you know fear? The answer rang back instantly, loud, clear, and defiant. Never, Dark One. You call me mortal, and expect me to tremble at the sight of you. But you are wrong, for I am as eternal as you. I, who have battled werewolves, vampires, and sorcerers in the past, have no qualms about subduing a demon of your ilk. With this, Dr. Weird shot forward toward the grotesque apparition on the stairs. Underneath the dark hood, the two great pits of blackness blazed scarlet for an instant, and the laughter began again, wilder than ever. So then, spirit, you would fight a demon? Very well, you shall have a demon. We will see who survives. The dark shape gestured impatiently with its hand. Dr. Weird had gotten halfway to the staircase when the crack above the altar suddenly opened in front of him and something huge and evil blocked his path. It stood well over twice his height, its mouth a mass of gleaming fangs, the eyes two baleful pinpoints of red. There was a musty odor of death in the air surrounding the monstrous entity. Barely pausing long enough to size up the situation, the golden ghost lashed out at the hideous newcomer, fist burying itself in the cold, clammy flesh. In spite of himself, Dr. Weird shuddered. The flesh of the monster was like soft yet super-strong dough, foul and filthy, so repulsive as to make the skin crawl. The being shrugged off the blow. Demoniac talons raked painfully and with stunning force across the shoulder of the mystic marauder, leaving a trail of agony in their wake. With sudden alarm, Dr. Weird realized that this was no creature of the ordinary realm, against which he was invulnerable. This horror was of the netherworld, and was as fully capable of inflicting pain upon him as he was on it. A great arm flashed out, catching him across the chest and sending him staggering backward. Gibbering and drooling horribly, the demon leaped after him, its great clawed hands reaching. Dr. Weird was caught squarely, thrown off balance, and slammed backward onto the cold stone floor. The thing landed on top of him. Gleaming yellow fangs flashed for his throat. In desperation, Dr. Weird swung his left arm around and up into the face of the demon as it descended upon him. Spectral muscles strained and his right fist connected with brutal force, smashing into the horrid visage like a pile driver. The thing gave a sickening squeal of pain, rolled to the side, and scrambled to its feet. In an instant, the golden ghost had regained his footing. 
eyes blazing hungrily at him, the demon rushed the super spirit once again, arms spread wide to grab him. Neatly sidestepping the charge and ducking under the outstretched arms, Dr. Weird took to the air as the creature's speed carried it past him. The demon stopped and whirled quickly, and the airborne wraith smashed into him feet first. The thing roared in anger as it toppled and lay flat. With all of the force he could muster, Dr. Weird brought the heel of his boot down squarely onto the demon's neck. Like a watermelon hit by a battering ram, the monster's head bulged, then smashed under the impact. Thick, dark blood formed a great pool on the stone floor, and the hulk-like demon did not stir. Dr. Weird staggered to one side in exhaustion. Devilish laughter rang about him, snapping him instantly to attention. Very good, spirit. You have entertained me. You have overcome a demon. Scarlet flashed again under the hood of the thing on the stairway. But I, you see, am no ordinary demon. I am Sagale, the demon prince, the lord of darkness. That subject of mine you disposed of with such difficulty is as nothing against my power. Sagale raised a hand and gestured at the fallen demon. You have shown me your might, so I will tell you of mine. That shell you found was my work, for I am he they called the Soul Destroyer and it is long since I have exercised my power. That mortal shall know no afterlife, no bliss nor damnation, no immortality. He is gone, as if he had never been, completely non-existent. I have eradicated his soul, and that is a fate far worse than death. The golden ghost stared up at him unbelievingly, and a cold chill went through him. You mean... The voice of the demon prince was raised in triumph. Yes, I perceive you know what I mean. So think, and now tremble. You are but a spirit, a discorporate entity. I cannot affect the physical shell of one of mortal birth, but you, a spirit, I could destroy utterly. But it will amuse me to have you stand by, helpless and fearful, while I enslave your world. So I shall spare you for now. Stand, and behold the fate of the planet where I reigned once, before history began, and now shall reign again. The Lord of Darkness gestured expansively, and all light in the temple vanished. A thick darkness prevailed everywhere, and a vision slowly took shape before the awestruck eyes of Dr. Weird. He saw men turn against other men in anger and hatred. He witnessed wars and holocaust and blood. Death, grinning and horrible, was everywhere. 
The world was bathed in chaos and destruction. And then, in the aftermath, he beheld flood and fire and plague and famine upon the land. Fear and superstition reached new heights. There was a vision of churches being torn down and of crosses burning against the night sky. Awesome statues were raised in their stead, bearing the hideous likeness of the demon prince. Everywhere men bowed before the great dark altars and gave their daughters to the priests of Sagael. And lo, the creatures of the night burst forth again in new strength, walking the earth and lusting for blood. Locked doors were no protection. The servants of Sagael ruled supreme on earth, and their dark lord hunted for men's souls. The gates of Korlos were opened, and a great shadow descended over the land. Not in a thousand generations would it be lifted. As suddenly as it had come, the vision was gone, and there was only the thick blackness and the hideous ringing laughter, more cruel now, coming from everywhere and nowhere, echoing and re-echoing in the confines of the huge temple. Go now, spirit, before I tire of you. I have preparations to make abroad, and I do not wish to find you in my temple when I return. Hark you this. It is morning now, yet all is still dark outside. From this day forth, night shall be eternal on earth. The darkness cleared, and Dr. Weird could see again. He stood alone in the empty temple. Sagale was gone, as were the remains of the vanquished demon. Only he and the thing that had once been a man called Jasper remained amongst the silence and the darkness and the dust. They came from all over, from the hot nearby jungles, from the burning desert beyond, from the great cities of Europe, from the frigid north of Asia. They were the hard ones the brutal ones, the cruel ones, those who had long waited the coming of one like the demon prince and welcomed him now. They were students of the occult. They had studied those black arts and ancient scrolls that sane men do not believe in, and they knew the dark secrets others spoke of in whispers. Sagale was no mystery to them, for their lore went back to the dim forgotten eras before history had begun, when the Lord of Darkness had held dominion over the earth. And now, from all the corners of the globe, they flocked to his temple and bowed before his statue. Even a dark god needs priests and they were eager to strain in his service in return for forbidden knowledge. When the long night had come over the earth, and the demon prince had roamed abroad and feasted, they knew their hour had arrived. So the unclean ones, the dark ones, the evil ones, jammed the great temple, even as in the days of yore and formed again the dreaded sect of Sagale. There they sang their songs of worship, and read their black tomes, and waited for the coming of their lord. For Sagale was still abroad. It was long since he had hunted men's souls, and his hunger was insatiable. But his servants grew impatient, and so they made for to summon him back. 
torches lit the black hall, and hundreds sat moaning a hymn of praise. They read aloud from the unholy texts, as they had not dared to do for many a year, and they sang his name. Sagel. The call went up and echoed in the depths of the temple. Sagel. It beckoned, louder and louder until the hall rang with it. Sagel. It demanded, a roar now, shrieking out into the night and filling the land and the air with the awful call. A young girl was strapped to the sacrificial altar, straining and tugging at her bonds, a look of horror in her wide, staring eyes. Now the chief of priests, a huge monster of a man with a brutal red slash for a mouth and two dark pig-like eyes, approached her. A long, gleaming silver knife was in his hand flashing with reflected torchlight. He halted and raised his eyes to the huge towering image of the demon prince that loomed above the altar. Sagel, he intoned, his voice a deep, eerie whisper that chilled the blood. Prince of demons, lord of darkness, Monarch of the netherworld, we summon thee. Soul destroyer, we your followers call. Hear us and appear. Accept our offer of the soul and spirit of this maiden. He lowered his eyes. The blade lifted slowly, began to descend. A hush came over the assemblage. The blade flashed silver. The girl screamed. Then something caught the sleeve of the priest's robe, bent his arm back with a wrench, and snapped it. A spectral figure glowed in front of the altar, and the knight paled in the illumination of the green and gold interloper. Pale white fingers grasped the knife as it fell from the hand of the priest. Wordlessly, they lifted the slim blade and drove it down into the heart of the huge man. Blood flowed. A gasp shocked the silence, and the body fell to the floor. As the intruder turned, and calmly slit the bonds of the now-fainted girl. Everywhere cries of rage and fear went up among the people, followed by cries of sacrilege and Sargale, protect us! Then, as if a heavy cloud had drifted overhead, a great darkness came over the hall, and one by one the torches winked out. Utter blackness flowed through the air, shimmered, and took shape. A cry of relief and triumph went up from the mortals present. Scarlet fires flamed under the blackness inside the hood. You have gone too far, spirit, boomed the voice of the demon prince. You attack the mortals who wisely choose to serve me. And for that, you shall pay with your very soul. The dark aura that surrounded the Lord of Corlos grew in strength and pushed back the light that emanated from the muscular figure in green and gold. Shall I? Dr. Weird replied. I think not. You have witnessed but a small part of my power. I have more I have never shown you. You were born of darkness and death and blood, Sagale. 
You stand for all that is evil and foul-made flesh. But I was created by the will of powers that dwarf you, that could destroy you with but a mere thought. I stand in defiance of you, those like you, and the vermin that serve you. The light that surrounded the golden ghost blazed once more and filled the hall like a small sun, driving the inky blackness of the demon prince before it. It was as if, suddenly, the Lord of Corlos had felt his first twinge of doubt. But he rallied himself, and without deigning the use of further talk, raised a gloved hand. To it, flowed the powers of darkness and death and fear. Then a massive bolt of black, pulsating power streaked through the air, evil and unclean. Straight it flew, and fast. The golden ghost stood his ground, hands on hips. The bolt struck him squarely, and light and darkness flashed for a moment. Then the light went out, and the figure fell quickly and soundlessly. A horrible mocking laughter filled the room, and Sagale turned to his worshippers. Thus perish those who would defy the dark power, those who would oppose the will of... He stopped. There was a look of total awesome fear on the faces of his disciples as they stared at something behind him. The demon prince whirled. The golden figure was rising to his feet. The light blazed forth once more, and momentary fear smote the Lord of Corlos. But again he overcame his doubt, and again an awesome bolt of black power shot through the air, smashing into the advancing Dr. Weird. Again the astral avenger keeled over. An instant later, as Sagale watched in mounting horror, the figure rose once more. Silently, wordlessly, it strode toward him. Panicking, Sagale smashed down the figure a third time. A third time it rose. A gurgle of horror went up from the crowd. The golden ghost advanced again toward the demon prince. Raising a glowing arm, at last he spoke. Too bad, Sagale. I have withstood the best you could throw at me and I still live. But now, Dark One, you shall feel my power. No! A hideous shriek went through the hall. The figure of the Lord of Darkness shuddered, paled, and melted away into a great black cloud. The crack opened again above the ebony altar. Beyond it mists swirled, and things moved in an eternal night. The black cloud expanded, flowed to the crack, and was gone. An instant later, the crack vanished. Dr. Weird turned to the mortals who filled the room the shocked and broken servants of Sagale. A howl of fear went up, and they fled screaming from the temple. Then the figure turned to the altar, shuddered, and fell. Something fluttered in the air above it, streaked across the room, and vanished into the shadows. An instant later, a second astral avenger strode from the dark recesses, walked to the altar, and bent over the first. A spectral hand 
wiped a layer of white makeup from the fallen figure's face. An eerie voice broke the silence. He called you a shell, an empty thing, and he was right. By reverting to my ectoplasmic form and hiding my physical self in the shadows, I was able to wear you like a suit of clothing. He could not affect your corporeal body, so I left you just before his bolt struck and got back in afterward. And it worked. Even he could be fooled and frightened. Outside, the sun was coming up in the east. In the interior of the grim sanctum, ebony benches and carved stairways rotted, decayed swiftly, and gave way to piles of dust. One thing now remained. Dr. Weird rose and approached the black altar. Mighty hands gripped the great legs of the statue of Sagale, and rippling muscles strained. The statue toppled and shattered. It fell, broken and smashed, near the empty hulk of the thing called Jasper, clad in a green and gold costume. Dr. Weird surveyed the scene with an ironic smile flicking over his dead white features. Even after he had destroyed your mind and soul, it was a man who brought about the downfall of the Lord of Darkness. He lifted his eyes to the girl on the altar now beginning to stir from the terror that had taken her consciousness. He approached her and said, Do not be afraid of me. I will take you home now. It was day outside. The shadow had lifted. The eternal night was over. Next issue, Dr. Weird meets the demon.